Well, good morning. Let's stand as we begin our worship this morning. Our first song is We Will Glorify. Sing this with me. We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords, who is the great I Am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty. We will bow before His throne. We will worship Him in righteousness. We will worship Him alone. He is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth. He is Lord of all who live. He is Lord above the universe. All praise to Him we give. Hallelujah to the King of kings. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lord of lords, who is the great I am. Sing that again. Hallelujah to the King of kings. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lord of lords, who is the great I am. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Sing with me as we welcome Jesus into our service this morning. Praise is rising, eyes are turning to you. We turn to you. A hope is stirring, hearts are yearning for you. We long for you. Cause when we see you, we find strength to face the day. And in your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away. Hosanna, Hosanna, you are the God who saves us, worthy of all. Uh... 
may be seated. As we continue to worship this morning, sing with me this one. That's why we praise Him. He came to live, live a perfect life. He came to be the living word, our light. He came to die, so we'd be reconciled. He came to rise, to show his power and might. That's why we praise him, that's why we sing. That's why we offer him our everything. That's why we bow down and worship the King, cause he gave his everything. Cause he gave his everything. He came to live, live a perfect life. He came to be the living word, our light. He came to die so we'd be reconciled. He came to rise to show his power and might. That's why we praise Him, that's why we sing, that's why we offer Him our everything, that's why we bow down and worship this King, cause He gave His everything, cause He gave His everything. That's why we sing, that's why we offer Him our everything, that's why we bow down and worship this King, cause He gave His everything, cause He gave His every. that's why we praise Him, that's why we sing, that's why we offer Him our everything, that's why we bow down and worship this King Cause He gave His everything Cause He gave His everything Cause He gave His everything Amen. Let's continue to worship as we sing God gave everything to us and became even our sin so that we could have his righteousness. And as we think about our preparation for our Lord's Supper this morning, let's think about just the sacrifice that Jesus actually did for each and every one of us. For He is our Savior. He is our Master. And He so much wants to be our friend. Sing this with me. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become His righteousness. He humbled Himself and carried the cross. Love so His body 
the bread, his blood the wine, broken and spilled out all for love. The whole world trembled and the veil was torn. Love so As I think about him being Lord of all, I have to think about the love that he shared with us. And again, as we approach the Lord's Supper this morning, think about that love. Think about all the good things, all the things that he's done for us to make him our Messiah, our Savior. But more than anything, he gave his blood, he gave his life for you and I. Let's think about that just as this song suggests. Sing it with me. Think about his love, think about his goodness, think about his grace that's brought us through.
is our life. All he wants is a surrender from us. And I thought how appropriate for us to sing. We use it as an invitation. But tonight, I mean this morning, it is, an, it is a, uh, it's a challenge before us this morning as we look to the Lord for guidance. I surrender all. Oh, sing this with me. To Jesus I surrender all To Him I freely give I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily thank you so much for what you did and what you accomplished. And this morning, we just ask, Lord, that your presence will be sensed in each of our hearts and our minds. May we focus upon you and all that you've done for us. Thank you so much for the love that you've shared, for that that you've given to us, to make us redeemed in your sight, to make us join heirs with Christ. Father, thank you for providing that way that we need it. Father, I know that it was hard and that it was even bloody and painful, and yet you loved us to the extent that you allowed it to take place. And God, thank you so much for giving your only son so that we could have that way. Bless your people this morning. Bless your word as it's shared. God, may we find ourselves in awe of you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, can I have my kiddos down forward? All oh, the kiddos. Good morning. Oh, 
All right. We've had a busy morning already. I'm excited. So, y'all find a place to sit. Everybody can sit on the steps? Okay. You can sit down there. All right. So, I want you to use your imaginations this morning, okay? I want you to think all the way back to the very first Palm Sunday. You've heard the Messiah has come. You've heard the great miracles he's been performing. Your best friend even witnessed one himself. Centuries of prophecy are coming to pass in front of your eyes. The king who is to deliver your people from domination and redeem Israel has finally, finally arrived. The time has come, and this Messiah is now riding into your town on a donkey. You dash to your backyard, to your palm tree, and quickly tear off some branches that might look like those right there. Those were a sign of victory and triumph. You give one to everybody in your family, and you begin to run out to the road to meet him. When you get there, you find a huge crowd of people, also with palm branches, waving them in the air and cheering on this Messiah. You take your cloak off and spread it on the ground in front of him. Suddenly, people start singing, and a a song rises from the crowd. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You sing along with great joy as you guide the Messiah all the way into town, waving your palm branches and proclaiming him as your king. That's Palm Sunday. It's an adventure. It's a real event in history. Of course, now we know this king's kingdom was not one of this world, but of the next. We cheer for him, eager for this most important triumph of all, his victory over death itself on Easter. Some of the events may sound strange, but Jesus was fulfilling prophecy. That's things that were foretold before he came to earth. So on this special day, we recall how Jesus was cheered and celebrated as he entered the city of Jerusalem Riding on a donkey. Speaking of donkeys, I know a game that involves donkeys. Have you ever played pin the tail on the donkey? Have you? You haven't? Oh, well, maybe showing my age here. It's an old popular party game where you have to attach a tail on the symbol of a donkey, kind of like this. Like you got like a poster that you kind of hung on the wall and it had these little tail pieces that you gave to people. And you were supposed to try and pin it right there to give him a tail. But then you know what they did to me? They put a blindfold on me, and then they spun me around. And after I was feeling so dizzy and didn't know which wall I was at, much less where the picture was and the donkey on the picture, they're like, here, put it on his tail. Well, that didn't happen. I think I hit somewhere up here in the big white space. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I think if I could have taken my blindfold off, I could have gotten pretty close. Do you think? You could have got it written. Right on. Maybe. This game kind of reminds me of our lives following Jesus. See, Jesus is the bullseye, and he lived a perfect and blameless life, and we try every day to follow him. And after we make a decision to follow Jesus, it's like we take the blindfold off, and we can see clearly. And if you haven't decided to follow Jesus, it's like you're trying to play this game in the dark, in the spinning, and you really can't even find the wall, much less the poster and the goal. Today we celebrate Palm Sunday. It's the beginning of Holy Week. And we know by the end of this week, Jesus will have been crucified. It was a horrible, horrible way to die. But he did it because he loves us. Even us, born 2,000 years later, Did you know Jesus died on the cross for you, and for you, and for you, and for you, and you, and you, and you, and you? The greatest ending to this week is when he rose again, and he's alive today. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Church, will you say it with me twice like you you mean it? One, one, two, three. Hosanna! Hosanna! Amen. As you go back to your seats, I have a little book for you that tells the story of Palm Sunday. I'll come get a little book.
You got me, Michael? Amen. When people came to Jerusalem that day, they came to celebrate. They came with a, a celebratory, a, a joyous attitude. They really did. They came in from the beginning. They, they were coming there to celebrate Passover. They were coming to celebrate freedom. Uh, they were coming to, to eat. I don't know about y'all, but it seems like the party's a little better when the meal's a little bigger, right? I miss potluck. Can I get an amen on I miss potluck? Is that okay? I, I, miss, well, I miss the fellowship, but I'll be honest with you, I miss y'all's food too. Y'all are good at it. You're just, it's a party and you, you see all of the food laid out and it, it's, it, it is an abundance and, and we are, we're celebrating what? Just being together. And, and these people were coming together and they were celebrating a coming up festival. Uh, one of the festivals, one of the seven times when they all would, would come together into Jerusalem and, and they would meet up with their friends and, and they would celebrate together. And it was a big party. And they, they came with this great celebration in mind and they were already pretty hyped up about Jesus. Jesus had been doing some stuff. You hear what I mean? Jesus had been doing some stuff. Not all of it they liked, but they were intrigued with all of it. I mean, he was, he was raising people from the dead. That's a pretty big one. He was healing people. But you know which one really got them excited? A free lunch. It, it, I know it's not silly, but if you go and look, every one of the Gospels talk about the free lunch. Jesus fed 5,000 people with a sack lunch. That was a big deal. Not everybody was dead and lame, but everybody got hungry. Jesus was a savior for everyone and people were excited about him. It said after the feeding of the 5,000 that they wanted to make him king by force. Now that doesn't mean they wanted to force everybody else to make him king. No, they wanted to... Think about that. They wanted to force Jesus to be, be king. That, how do you think that was going to go over? You know, you, you kind of say, well, you know, the, the Romans took care of him pretty quick. They were able to beat him down and crucify him. No, they only were allowed to. Because when my Jesus was in uh, the, the garden the, the night before his crucifixion, and they walked up and they said, he said, who are you looking for? And they said, I'm looking for Jesus of Nazareth. A big old legion for me, lots of soldiers, good soldiers. And Jesus says, I am, and all of them fall flat on their back. That's two words. Can you imagine what power he could do with three? He did. It was called, it is finished. Jesus was all powerful even then. He didn't need anybody to make him king. God had already ordained that. When Jesus rode in that morning, everyone proclaimed. Luke chapter. We've been running through the book of Luke. We've been on a journey each week, getting closer and closer to Jerusalem ever since the, the Luke said, and Jesus set his face toward Jerusalem. Well, this is what he set his face towards, and he knew the whole story going into it. In Luke chapter 19, starting in verse 28, and when he, Jesus, had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem, where he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany uh, at the mount of that is called Olivet, uh, or the Mount of Olives. And he sent two of the disciples saying, Go into the village in front of you. We're entering it. You will find a colt tied there on which none, no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. Um, I had a buddy of mine tell me years ago that this verse right here proved that Jesus was a cowboy. He said only a cowboy would ride an unbroke colt through the middle of a parade and want everybody to know about it. Let me give you just a little bit of a picture real quick of what this looks like. Y'all remember listening to the stories about uh, Jesus going up to the Garden of Gethsemane okay, on, and the Mount of Olives. This is, if you were to go out the eastern gate of, of Jerusalem, uh, you have to first go down, okay, because you're going to go down into a wadi, into a, a ravine, into a, a valley. And when you get to the bottom of it, you have a choice. You can go left and you can go to Jericho. That's the Jericho Road. It was kind of dangerous from what I hear. 
you could go right and it, the wadi kind of plays out a little bit and moves into more of the valleys and, and there's, there's land there and lots of villages and stuff that way. But if you go up the next mountain, just right down the bottom and go back the other side, you're going to go up, you're going to get to where the Garden of Gethsemane was and then right past that, not, not far, is a village. It's more or less kind of right on the outskirts of, uh, of Jerusalem and it was called Bethany. So in the village there, as Jesus is coming from Jericho, he says, go up to the village and you're going to find an unbroke colt there. Uh, today you're not going to see a lot of that. Do you know what's actually covering all that now? Graves. I'm not making this up. You go look at it. It is, one, it is a rolling graveyard. People just dying to get in there. Truth be known, it is the most expensive graveyard in the world. Close to the eastern gate itself, graves there for go for over a million dollars. And you don't even get the whole spot. You get stacked. Why in the world would somebody want to spend a million dollars to be buried where everybody else is already at? Because they truly believe that one day a king is going to ride through that gate. And there's going to be people shouting Hosanna. And there's going to be palm branches waving. They even believe because of a scripture written in Zechariah, he's going to come in on, guess what? An unbroken colt, a foal of a donkey. Now that wasn't that big of a deal then. Today that would be wild, right? If a guy's going to come in today and he was going to be a king, he wouldn't be coming in on a donkey. He'd probably be coming in on a helicopter. But no, they believe that and they want to be right there when the king of kings comes. Do you want to be in the presence of God when he comes and declares a victory? Oh yeah, you do. Worth every dollar you'll ever make out if that really was what it took. Praise God it didn't. They came for a celebration. They even today will pay out everything to be a part of that celebration. And as they got there, they looked and they saw him and they did not get it. See, they'd already been told. John told them. John the Baptist told them. Which I think it's interesting because when you're reading what John the Baptist said, it's written in the Gospel of John. So John said that John said. John said that John said that Jesus was coming and he, he proclaimed to everybody in the crowd, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's a pretty bold statement. You just don't say that about anybody. He didn't say, Behold, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That would have been just as true. He didn't say, Behold, here comes the Son of God and the Son of Man. All of that would have been true. But no, John looked down and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. They just didn't quite get it. It's, it's a long story. It's really all the way through their history, which is our history. It goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve sinned. You remember that part? And then they covered themselves with fig leaves. I, I hope their fig leaves aren't as itchy as the fig leaves we have today because I don't think that would have been very fun. Jesus decided we could do better than this. And he looks and he says, I can cover your sin. And he slayed a lamb to cover the blood sacrifice, the death that needed to cover the sin. And then he took that lamb skin and he made for them clothes to cover their shame. Not because naked was a problem, but because shame was. And then later... Later, when he was, when he was trying to, to save and comfort the Jews in their worst of situations, they, they were in a bad place. But you ever been at a bad place? I mean, bad place. You didn't have any hope left. You really didn't even know. I mean, what was the point? And, and, and it's just bad. That's where the Jews were. They were in a bad place. They were slaves, and the slavery was getting. God had told them he was going to save them, but yet here they were in the worst of the place. They were in Egypt, and they were making bricks. I don't know about y'all, but playing in the mud all day long just doesn't sound like that much fun. But it was a hard, hard life. 
And they called out and they called out and God answered. And he said to them after Moses had come and they had already had multiple plagues and, and he, he, had a, he was going to make Pharaoh let them go. He wasn't going to just come in and take them. He was going to make Pharaoh let them go. And in Exodus chapter 12, we hear about the Lamb, the Lamb of God. In 12, verse, Exodus 12, starting in verse 1, it says, The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all of the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to his, their father's house, a lamb for the household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat, and you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old, and you may take it from the sheep or from the goats. And you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the doorpost and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat. God had already declared His righteous judgment. And the judgment of God was coming in the form of death. He gave very, very specific instructions to the Israelites to make a sacrifice of a lamb for the sins and to cover the lintel of their door with that blood. And as the angel of death came over that night, he passed over the homes with the blood. Of course, in the blood, there was redemption. In the blood, there was salvation. And it was found in the lamb. Now, there's a few things here I want to kind of point out because I didn't know them. If I didn't know them, I'm assuming some of you may have not picked it up either. And a lot of it comes across because, like I've been saying lately, we're just not Jewish enough. <laughs> there are times we're just missing some of this because I had read that before. I even remembered very clearly that the lamb had to be without blemish. Uh, I knew that part. I even remember listening to a pastor tell me you know, how they would count hairs like if it had spots on it, or if it had more than a couple of hairs, that one's not okay. And they would send it out. Even if the skin was discolored, they would say that one wasn't good enough. And they had to go and, and do whatever it took to get a perfect lamb for them to be able to sacrifice. Uh, I knew that part. What I didn't pick up on was the 10th day and the 14th day thing. Didn't seem to matter to me. Anybody else? Okay, didn't matter to you either. It really doesn't in the sense that we know that the story still plays out doesn't matter what day it came on but what is very very interesting is that we know exactly what day that Jesus is entering the city of Jerusalem we know exactly what day it is it's the day of preparation and presentation they not only had to prepare everything for this meal because they were moving into a Sabbath all right Understand that we don't take Sunday as seriously as they took Saturday. All right? They didn't work at all. The preparation had to be done. And in this particular situation, you have one Sabbath per week, but you also have seven Sabbaths per year in the Jewish culture that are declared by God around His seven holy days, His seven feasts many of which they came up to Jerusalem to do. And this was one of them. They were coming into a Sabbath and they had to have everything done. And before they could kill the lamb, it had to be publicly displayed for the people to see it was without blemish. On the day that they were showing their lambs, God showed His. On the day that, that they were preparing for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that they were preparing for Passover, like I'm preparing for Passover. I'm preparing for uh, us to, to have 
a time we reflect back on, on not just Jesus, but on all of the sal salvations, the saving times that happened throughout Scripture. We can celebrate the fact that God did not just kill Adam and Eve and start over. If that were true, He'd do just as well to kill me too. Because I promise you I'm worse. And, and I think it's exciting that, that God was able to not only save them from slavery and, and to do it through the blood, but, but to do it in a way that He declared to the rest of us, I know what the slavery of sin is on your life, and I am declaring you a way out. And then the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate redemption, the ultimate lamb goes on display for everyone to see. I don't think they checked his hairs. They probably didn't check for skin spots. But they declared him perfect. They declared him Hosanna. They didn't just declare him good enough to be king. They didn't go out that day and declare him, Hey, this is the one we want to follow. Maybe he'll make it. No, they went back and they were chanting back the words that had been chanted for years. It had been written into song. They said, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They were quoting back Old Testament scripture. They were quoting the teaching of the day. They were shouting out, This is the Messiah. This is the God promised answer of the promise to Abraham fleshed out right here in front of us. And yet, they didn't get it. Zechariah says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey. On a colt. On a foal of a donkey. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Do we get it? Here's the real. I just, as I go into the day, I know Easter's right around the corner. It's, it's the, the best part of the year. It's the greatest season. We celebrate Jesus and we celebrate what He did. And we even, to some extent, we're waving our palm branches. We're laying our cloaks at His feet. Uh, we're making sacrifices in our life to say, hey, I believe in this. And then I do honestly believe that sometimes we're just a shy bit short of really understanding that God poured out His blood and He put it on your life and He saved you from the death you really deserved. And for that, we get to celebrate. That the grace of God is sufficient for us. The amazing grace covered all of your sin. All of it. For that, we can celebrate. I know the story gets a little dark. We know this. Between now and next Sunday, the story got dark. Yes, Jesus is going to be Beaten. He's going to be whipped so bad nobody could recognize him. He's going to have so much damage done to his body he should have died three times. And yet he endures all the way to what? <laughs> to the 14th day at twilight where all of Israel shall kill their Lamb. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Amen. Today we come together, we celebrate Passover, we celebrate uh, Palm Sunday. Jesus was coming to celebrate Passover, so we're, we're here to celebrate Passover. Uh, we're going to do as He did that night. We're going to take of the cup. We're, we're going to take of the unleavened bread. 
um, I hope theirs tastes better than ours does. They were much better at it. They did it. They made it every year. But I honestly think that the fact that we got to struggle a little bit today to get these little cups open, maybe that little bit of struggle remind you how little your struggle really is. Maybe that little bit that you squeezed too hard and it, it got out on your thumb. Try not to get it on that pale yellow shirt. Fonda, that, that ain't coming out. Maybe it'll remind you of all the blood that was shed. Maybe the bitterness of the tears and the wine will remind you of the cost that was paid. But then let the sweetness remind you that you can celebrate for grace has covered your life and God has passed over your judgment. Father God, we thank you. You are holy. You are precious. You are the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Lord, today we celebrate that and we stop for just a moment and ask for your forgiveness. We ask for your um, help in repenting. We know that even that, we, we need your strength to even accomplish that. We ask you, Lord, to, to guide our hearts, to lead our hearts right now, Lord, to repentance and, and into your forgiveness so that we may enter this moment uh, holy. Father, Lord, if we have wronged someone, please forgive us and help us to go make those amends. Lord, if we're struggling with forgiving ourselves, help us. Lord, to know your forgiveness is on your blood, not ours. Father, Lord, lead us, guide us, protect us. And we ask this in the name of Jesus, our Lamb. Amen.